This is the fourth Sunday of Advent here in San Diego, California. The epistles taken from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Brother, let a man so account of us, as of the ministers of Christ and the dispensers of the mysteries of God. Here now it is required among the dispensers that a man be found faithful. But to me it is a very small thing to be judged by you or by man's day, but neither do I judge my own self. For I am not conscious to myself of anything, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge not before the time until the until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise from God. The Holy Gospel. From St. Luke chapter 3. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and Philip his brother tetrarch of Eturia, in the country of Chetraconitis, in Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilina, under the high priest Annas and Caiaphas. The word of the Lord came to John the son of Zachary in the desert. And he came into all the country about the Jordan, preaching the baptism of penance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the sayings of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. The crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways plain. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. On this uh, fourth Sunday of Advent, we are now, tomorrow is going to be Christmas Eve. There will be Mass here in the morning at, at 8 o'clock. Morning Mass here, 8 o'clock for Christmas Eve. It's a first class feast, yet it's also a, a day of fast and abstinence for Christmas. And then the day after will be the great solemnity of Christ's birth, Christmas Day, December the 25th. The day of great joy, because it's the birthday, 2018 years ago, Christ was born. And even our, even the date system that we still have, the, of course the enemies of Christ, especially the Jews, are always trying to work to change even the dating system. They want to call it the common era and the, the post-common era, but that makes no sense. Our time is measured according to Jesus Christ, before B.C., before Christ, uh, A.D., Anno Domini, the year of the Lord. So Christ is the center of all history. He's the center of everything, and he's the creator of everything, because through him everything was made. Through the mouth of our Lord, when He spoke, the miracles poured out. And many, most of the miracles were just by the power of His Word or a touch. And it's the same God, who's the Son, who in the six days of creation, He spoke. And it was made. Let there be light, and light was made. And let the lands be divided. Day three, and the plants and animals, and uh, and all the days of creation, it all comes into existence not millions of years of a evolutionary process, which is ridiculous and unscientific, and really it's a it's a lie and a satanic religion being taught in all the modern education, the lie of evolution. But Genesis is very clear, and it has the authority of God behind it. And that is, by the power of His Word, things were made. And this is the same Jesus Christ who worked the miracles. The same Jesus Christ, our God, who became 
flesh for us in the womb of the Virgin Mary. On March 25th was the incarnation of God in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And exactly nine months later, December 25th, he was born. And he's born in relation to St. John the Baptist. Remember there will be a time when St. John the Baptist will say about our Lord, Behold the Lamb of God. He will point him out. That's why at Mass the priest will hold the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ and the Sacred Host. And he'll say those words of St. John the Baptist, Ece on his day. Behold, this is the Lamb of God. And St. John was the one pointing him out to all the crowds and all the apostles. There he is. That's the one spoken by all the prophecies. Moses and Abraham and Isaiah and Jeremiah, Daniel and Ezekiel. That's him. That's on his day. That's the one. He's the Lamb. And this Lamb will be become small for us in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And this Lamb will be born for us in the, from the womb of the Virgin Mary. And carried nine months in the womb of the Virgin Mary. So already once the Virgin Mary received this tremendous honor and dignity to be Mother of God, and she was prepared from all eternity to be the most precious chalice to hold this Lamb of God in her womb. The Virgin Mary was prepared and she was never stained by sin. She was conceived without sin. The, the passage of original sin was blocked by Christ's precious blood, hence her immaculate conception. And this is what Our Lady told St. Bernadette in Lourdes. I am the Immaculate Conception. And St. Bernadette had no idea what, what those words meant. And when she told the parish priest, her name is, I'm the Immaculate Conception. The priest said to St. Bernadette, do you realize what you're saying? Do you realize what this means? And she said, no, I have no idea what this means. And the priest explained, so that's who appeared to her, the Immaculate Conception. Mary, pure. Mary, the most precious vessel to hold the living God. So for nine months, and now we are two days before Christmas, the journey to Bethlehem was at least five to eight days on foot. It was a journey of about 90 miles on foot. And then the weather there, at this time of the year in December, it's cold. It's in the 30s and 40s during the day, rainy, but then it drops <clears throat> freezing and below freezing at night. So certainly St. Joseph and Our Lady traveling to Bethlehem <clears throat> with the donkey, and possibly in groups, because they did travel in groups, and it was the census being called by the Roman Emperor. And as the as St. Gregory the Great says, the emperor on earth was calling a census of the whole empire, but the living emperor of heaven and earth, greater than any authority on earth, Jesus Christ, he was coming as emperor to enroll all those of goodwill for heaven, for his kingdom. And that's what was taking place. So as they entered into Bethlehem, after probably eight to ten days walking, then they find no room in, the, in any hotel. And St. Joseph was from there also. He had relatives there. That's where he was born. But all the relatives had poured in because of the census. So there was no room even for him. And St. Joseph was, was, according to some of the mystics, he was... Um, kind of a semi-outcast from the family, at least his brothers. And he used to often go to the cave to pray. And he knew this cave, and where it would be on the kind of a lean-to, off the road, but not too far from it. And it's there that he would build a fire, clean out some of the... the, um, the 
the whole manger, the whole stable, and prepare the manger to receive our Lord Jesus Christ, born in a manger, born in Bethlehem. So St. Gregory the Great says, Bethlehem means house of bread. And it will be he that will say, born there, I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. And this bread of heaven is laid on hay for the animals to eat. But who are the animals? St. Augustine says, we are the animals. And we eat this living God-made flesh, this house of bread, this living bread. How do we eat this living bread? In the Holy Eucharist, in the Holy Mass. And then every Mass reenacts the same miracle, the same sacrifice of Christ, our living bread giving nourishment to the soul, strength to the soul. And listen to these great words here of St. Augustine, where he says, <clears throat> O blessed infancy, by which the life of our race, the human race, is restored. O most pleasant and delightful cries, of the infant Jesus, by which we, because of his cries, we have escaped the gnashing of teeth and eternal weeping. O oh, happy swaddling clothes that wrap the child Jesus, whereby the filth of our sins is wiped away. O oh, splendid manger, in which not only lies the hay of the animals, but the bread of angels is found. So this mystical night of Christmas, the, often these Protestant movies portray the birth of our Lord. She's giving birth in great pain and screaming, and she's, and she's uh, breathless and tired because she's with child. That was not the case at all. St. Bernard says, to carry Christ for nine months was a delight for her. It was not exhausting. And then when she gave birth to Christ in, in the stable, it was an ecstasy of sheer joy. And she was surrounded by millions, all of heaven came. The armies of heaven, the angels surrounded this, this incredible reality and mystery that God becomes a tiny little baby. Think in the minds of the angels how shocking this must have been. Because in heaven they see God as He is. They can hardly look at His brightness. They fall down and adore Him, singing Santus, Santus, Santus. And His beauty, His splendor, His glory, they can never get enough because it's so overwhelming. And yet that God, the second person of the, with the Father and the Holy Ghost, the Son, they see Him now clothed in our clay, dressed in our flesh, and as a little baby, as a tiny baby. Listen to these words of St. Ambrose. He says, He therefore was little, a tiny infant, that you might be perfect. Because he told us, be, become like children to enter the kingdom of heaven. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes that you might be freed from the snares of death. He was in a crib that you might be on the altars. He was on earth that you might be in heaven. He had no room in the inn that you might have many mansions among the inhabitants of heaven, that being rich become, that being rich became poor for your sake, that through his poverty you might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8 9. And then St. Ambrose continues, His poverty, therefore, is my riches, and the weakness of my Lord is my strength. He preferred to experience poverty and want, so that all might have abundance. 
The weeping of that wailing infant washes me. Those tears have wiped away my sins. Therefore, Lord Jesus, I owe to thy sufferings the fact that I am redeemed, more than I owe to thy works the fact that I am created. So, our Lord Jesus Christ weeping his first prayers in the cold of Bethlehem. And St. Joseph no doubt built a fire because it would drop down to below freezing weather. You could see your breath. And then one of the prophecies of Habakkuk from the Septuagint. Habakkuk lived in the time of Daniel, so that's about 600 years before Christ. And Habakkuk prophesies that there would be two animals, that, the, the, that God would be born and found between two animals. And the breath of the animals, the, the donkey and the ox, with their powerful breathing, and uh, that was that formed like a heater, and it warmed the body of our Lord as He was laying in the manger. And what about the Virgin Mary giving birth? Some medical questions you might have that are answered actually by the fathers of the church. And one of them is, how was he born? And they, the, all the saints say, he was born miraculously. That is, through the womb of the Virgin Mary, leaving her virginity completely intact. So, as he passed through the walls of the upper room at the resurrection, not coming through the door, but through the walls, so he passed through the walls of the womb of the Virgin Mary, says St. Gregory, St. Augustine, St. Bede, and all of them. And then what about something you mothers might be really wondering about? What, the, what about the umbilical cord? To get very medical here, what about that? <coughs> Father Cornelius de Lapide, he says this. He was a holy priest in the 1600s. And he wrote the, the whole commentaries on Scripture. Here's what he says. Therefore, Franz Lucas says, She took in her hands the one who had come forth from her womb, like a ripe apple falling from a tree, the umbilical cord unloosing itself spontaneously and without violence, just as the stem of a ripe apple detaches itself from the tree. Kneeling, the Blessed Mother adored him whom she held, and then kissed him most sweetly and wrapped him in the clothes and bands. Hence, St. Cyprian also says, Of its own accord, the ripe fruit fell from the tree, nor was it necessary to pluck what came forth of itself. So there's the answer to the umbilical, <laughs> umbilical cord. And then St. Paul will say about Christ weeping, crying, his first tears in the manger. He says in Hebrews 5, 7, uh, Who in the days of his flesh, with a strong cry and tears, offering up prayers and supplications, was heard for his reverence. And he says, Father Cornelius says, At his birth Christ offered these tears along with himself and his whole life, death and crucifixion to God as a holocaust for the salvation of mankind. So it's around this child the angels came. And the Virgin Mary, as Mary of Agreda says, she was surrounded by a, an intensely bright light. And it was an ecstasy of joy. And in miraculously, the child Jesus was born, no need to surgically cut the umbilical cord, it was already cut, it was already dissolved. And so she adored the divine child with St. Joseph. And then the angels called the shepherds. And they, the sh these shepherds are the first adorers of our Lord Jesus Christ, the simple ones, the simple ones. And they come with, with haste. And they find the child Jesus. What's the sign? You will see a, a child wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. Why the wrap, why wrapped in swaddling clothes? In the Mass, 
You notice when the priest purifies the chalice, he all those sacred linens that touch the chalice, that purify the ciborium. And the Mass takes place on the relics of the saints, and then there must be three cloths, three altar cloths, and then the top cloth, which is a corporal. And that corporal is specially blessed, and it has nine folds in it, like the nine armies of angels that hold up the glory of God, so to speak. This corporal, on this corporal, takes place the consecration. And the priest in the seminary, you'll be told, when you become a priest, you will intend only to consecrate what's on the corporal. Because if the priest is careless with his intention, he can, he can consecrate all the bread in the nearby bakery if he wasn't careful. He has that power. So he makes that specific intention, I will only consecrate what's on the corporal. Then he says the words, and then after Mass, he either um, returns the, the leftover hosts in the ciborium to the, to the tabernacle, and then locks the tabernacle, or he purifies it. But all that purification of the linens, and then the covering of the chalice with the chalice veil, all this symbolizes Christ, his body, and his death being wrapped at his death by the shroud. But this is already prefigured and foretold when the Virgin Mary wraps him in swaddling clothes. And in the Eastern explanations of the Eastern Fathers, they say the swaddling clothes was more like bands, like someone who's wrapped like a mummy. And that's why in some of the icons of the East, the child Jesus is lying in the manger, <laughs> and he's wrapped really like a mummy in bands. So the direct relation of why he came is right there. That's the sign of the shepherds. As he comes, born on wood, lying on wood, at the beginning of the first day of his birth, and wrapped in swaddling clothes, so you'll find him dead in the arms of his mother, wrapped in the shroud, <coughs> and lying on wood, the wood of the cross dead on wood. So the Virgin Mary, all this, St. Luke says, and he talked to her, that's why we know so many details of this, because he spoke with the Virgin Mary, St. Luke. He heard this from her mouth, and he says she kept all these things in her heart. And that's why you can certainly, there's no doubt at all, as the Virgin Mary held the dead body of Christ in her arms at the foot of the cross, the Pieta. She certainly thought of that day in the manger, holding the child she is wrapped in swaddling clothes, nursing him, and lying him in a wooden manger with some hay to keep him warm. But all those memories, no doubt, came back to her as she held this innocent lamb, <coughs> butchered from our sins, my sin, in her arms at the foot of the cross. How impressive that had to be. How, how moving for the heart of Mary. And she, she just, as, as, as Jeremiah says in the Lamentations, Who can console thee, O daughter of Jerusalem? For deep as the sea is thy sorrow, who can console thee? Who has cried as a river of tears to wash the body of our Lord. And all this is already foreshadowed at the first moment of his birth in the manger. But yet, look at the love of God. He's born in a manger. In French, ma manger means manger, which means to eat. So the animals eat out of a manger. But St. Gregory says, we're the animals. Because we were clothed in animal skin by our, in our first parents who were clothed by God Himself in the skin of the Lamb. Christ, imagine this, God making clothing, as a girl makes clothing for her dolls, 
God made clothing for Adam and Eve out of lamb skin, the animal skins of a lamb. He dressed them for Adam and Eve, our first parents. They were dressed in animal skins. But now this lamb will clothe us with his own divine life, sanctifying grace. That's what we're supposed to be dressed in, sanctifying grace in our soul. With the Holy Trinity dwelling in our soul, we're supposed to live this way. This is the joy, Christ said, I have come, that you might have joy and have it to the full. That's what he means. The fullness of that joy and union with the Blessed Trinity by sanctifying grace. <coughs> and in our body, dressed also with the scapular, like a shield on the front and on the back, and the rosary nearby in our pockets. These are our weapons. But the life of grace, this is what Christ came to give us, the sharing. But He feeds us, manger, we're the animals that feed on Him in the Holy Eucharist. That's why Holy Communion promises you eternal life, promises you the, the washing away of even purgatory. One Holy Communion, well received, says St. Thomas Aquinas, could wash away your entire purgatory, depending on the charity and the love of God. And the power of the Holy Eucharist, the love of God in the Holy Eucharist, that He becomes our food. So, so at every Mass, really, and tonight, right now, here in the altar, here in this humble home, you have a little Bethlehem right here. Bethlehem takes place in every Mass. The living God comes down, and you receive Him as uh, the, the living bread that comes down from heaven. And Bethlehem means the house of bread. But the living bread, Jesus Christ the King. So see in every aspect the tremendous love of God everywhere. He pours out, and He pours Himself out so that we love Him in return. And that's why He embraces the coldness of winter. He chose the hour to be born. He chose the season. He chose the most uncomfortable season. Wet, rainy, cold. And that's where He's found. And the shepherds come and adore Him. And then 13 days later, the Magi, the three kings, come and adore Him. So let's kneel down with the saints, the angels, with the Virgin Mary and St. Joseph in this Mass. And for some of you, this will be your Christmas Mass. So receive our Lord tonight and ask Him to make your soul always a place where He's loved. You might not, we might not have much in our soul for virtues and generosity and all the virtues of the great saints. We might really be a simple cave with some straw and hay and dirt. And, all right, that needs to be cleaned out by good confession and sincere contrition. But let the light of Christ fill our soul and keep striving for virtue, striving for the love of God, striving to offer everything you do, whether you eat or drink, sleep, study, cook, do dishes, work, whatever you do, do it with the Immaculate Heart of Mary, because she did it all. And she teaches us how to live. She teaches us how to adore Jesus Christ and St. Joseph also. And they, 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 both of them, there was not one moment they were not ascending in intensity and speed and grandeur in the love of God, St. Joseph and Our Lady. So let's have a great devotion to them and ask them to teach us this tremendous humility of heart that St. Joseph had in Our Lady, the great love of God, and to become like little children. Because if we don't, we cannot enter the Kingdom of Heaven. And becoming like little children, that means we got to fight like soldiers for the truth. The truth doesn't change. The Catholic truth cannot be modernized, nor adapted, nor adopted to the modern evolutionary progress. It doesn't change like that. And that means to be truly children of God, we've got to fight for these unchanging truths. The Mass of all time, the Catholic faith of all time, the unchanging 
condemnations of the errors of the great popes and the magisterium of the church, as Archbishop Lefebvre held, we got to hold that same line until, until again, Our Lady's victory comes. And that victory is promised. It is promised. There's probably never been a darker time in history, except maybe, well, even Pope Pius XII said that even in the 50s, he said, man has fallen lower than in the time before the flood. So we have fallen very low. And yet Our Lady, her, her victory will overthrow all this. So let's put ourselves under her mantle and adore this beautiful mystery of God born in Bethlehem in two days. May that joy fill your soul and inspire you to fight on until you obtain that vision of the Trinity in heaven. O Mary conceived without sin, O Mary conceived without sin, O Mary conceived without sin, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Amen.